Amen. I want to ask you this evening, if you will, to join me in the book of Philippians, chapter number two, the book of Philippians, chapter number two, and uh, I was a little torn today about, uh, over the last few days, more specifically today, um, about this evening's service, the direction for that, and uh, it seemed like everything that I was working on felt good about the Lord just seemed to shift that a little bit this afternoon and um, I'm going to kind of go back and at least the theme of what we were talking about on Sunday and um, ask the Lord to just touch our hearts this evening I talked Sunday about the church united amen I'm thankful to be a part yes. of a united yes. church the book of Philippians chapter 2 verse number 1 and 2 the Bible says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and, and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Amen. And I want to I just take that last line for my subject this evening of one accord of one mind, amen, of one accord, of one mind. In a world that is so pressed, scattered, it seems as though that just life in general almost just seems like a kaleidoscope, amen, God is calling for the church to be one accord and one mind. It would be so easy to be distracted in the world in which we live, amen. But God is calling on us, mandating this sense of spiritual focus. Amen. God bless you and you can be seated. Of the, of the many things that we could learn from the world of athletics, I think one common thing that we can take away from uh, any field, whatever that sport may be, is the importance of coming together around a common goal. That may seem trite even almost trivial, but if you want to win, the spirit of unity among a team is essential. It has to be more than a suggestion and a good thought, but everybody has to center themselves around one common goal, one common purpose. I am not an athlete, you know that by now, and um, don't take a lot of interest in any of those things. I'm not against them, but not extremely interested in them. But I've always been amazed and thought it somewhat uh, intriguing how teams can be find themselves sometimes even at halftime uh, or even beyond, just so far in the red. There's no way to turn it around. But somehow there's a rallying spirit that just comes from within. I know there can be some luck of the draw, there can be interceptions and things of that nature, but in many cases what causes something like that to turn, the tide to stem, is that somewhere somebody got reunited around the purpose. I know there are a lot of talk about maybe halftime talks, a lot of focus on those things and not to take away from any of that, but I doubt you could say any one thing that would change the course of something. Something has in just somebody to hear it with their ears. You've got to hear it in your heart. There has to be somebody that brings back to the, the desk, somebody brings back to the table that one power of unity, that together 
we can. And so you can have the best athletes, you can have the best coaching staff, but if that team doesn't work together, there's no way for them to win. You can have the greatest athletes, you can have the greatest coaching staff, you can have all of those things, but if there is not a common goal of unity at the heart of what they're doing, because simply put, one person cannot do it all. It is impossible. And so in any given season, just like life, there could be many things to distract us along the way. And, and, and life is filled with distractions. Life is not just little, sometimes trivial things, but many times we're facing tall mountains. And we could all make our own laundry list this evening and of things that we're dealing with at this very moment, right now, yes. happening now, <laughs> playing out in real living color before us and in our days and at the end of the day, it won't really matter what items we list. It won't matter what things we bring to the table. If we let it keep us from giving our all, if we let it and allow it to keep us from being unified, if we allow those things to happen, then ultimately everybody suffers. We can't allow those distractions. Something has to come along to bring us back to center. And I'm thankful for the word of God. I really appreciate the word of God. We're so privileged today, and, and I don't want to overstate the obvious, but we're so privileged today not only to live in a country where we have the freedom to, to own a Bible, the freedom to, to possess a Bible, but I would, I would venture to say that most people in this audience tonight probably own more than one Bible. And uh, if you have a smart device of any sort, uh, we've got many times access to all manner of digital uh, scriptures that we can read them, we can listen to them, we can listen to them as uh, somebody just recites them in a plain version. We have dramatic, uh, dramatized versions of the scripture that kind of bring the scripture to life. And so the word of God, sometimes it's just that peace that we need. Amen. I love to start my day with the word of God. I love to start my day reading the word of God, but sometimes I just want to reach over and and uh, put an earbud in and just turn on my phone, my Bible, and just, just listen to it a little bit before I even get out of bed. I just want to let the Spirit of the Lord, I want His Word to touch me because I know that's a must. I've got to have His Word. And so our effectiveness is going to be determined by what we have inside, not by just exterior qualities, but what's inside. Not our abilities, not our talent, but it's going to be what is in our heart. I believe that God is not really impressed by how smart we are intellectually, and I'm not promoting ignorance, but I don't think God is as impressed with those things as, as we may be. I don't think God may be as impressed with our talents as we are. He's not impressed about how much Bible knowledge we may even have. But what God is after is a heart that is truly devoted to Him. A heart truly devoted to Him. I believe that the Lord is looking to see how much of His character is really being developed in our life if we're hearing the word only or if it is actually taking place and taking root in our heart. Are we becoming more like him? Are we right on the inside? There, I think there's some essential questions that we should ask ourselves. I think it's important because the answers are going to reveal what's really going on in our heart. And what's going on inside is our lives is going to really affect what's going on inside of the kingdom of God, the function, the overall health of the work of the local church or as that church ministry begins to spread. Unfortunately, what many people experience in church, that's what we're talking about tonight is church. I guess we could apply this to many other things, but what many experience, what people, many people experience is not a singleness of heart and not a singleness of purpose or not a unity of the spirit because what many people experience is the complete opposite of that and it's because we've got people involved. You know how much smoother life would be if you could just take people out of it? But when you throw people in the mix, there's going to be problems. That's just, how it, that's just how it works. And so we have conflicting desires. We have our own will, our own wishes. But this problem is not something new. And this is not a, uni a problem that is unique to here or there or anywhere else. Because the New Testament church is barely born. It's a, an infant. And we find Acts 15 real issues 
serious issues, a real divisive spirit and a divisive attitude. But, but, but just because the problem has been around a long time is not an indication that it's not something we should take serious. We need the Spirit of God to help us be of one accord and of one mind. The work of God is always hindered. It is always disrupted by the spirit of unity. And that is one of the greatest challenges that the church has ever faced. I'm talking about the church at large. I believe and I know for a fact we've talked about it in, in recent weeks or months that you could build a church right next to a bar. The bar is not going to be the problem. I can promise you the bar is not going to be the problem. It may be an inconvenience. It, it, may not, it may be an eyesore. There may be things that happen we're not pleased with, but that's not going to be the issue. The issue is going to be inside because it's inside those hearts. It's inside our minds. Amen. So uh, this is the focus of Paul's message in our text. And he gives us a few essential reasons that we should be able to come together. I believe that when Paul begins to mention these things, that we need to reflect upon them in our own heart and mind. One of the things that Paul mentions is that we should remember all the things that we've received of the Lord. God has been good to me. And I believe that you can say, God has been good to me. If you're a child of God, then you're a recipient of many blessings of God. And I, sh I am confident that you, just like me and any other, could, could look around us and we could see the tangible blessings of the Lord. If it hadn't been for the Lord, I wouldn't have this. I wouldn't have that. I wouldn't have the other. Those are the things we can put our eyes on. We can place our hands on. Those are the things that we could actually put on a list. The things that we, we have received from God. But I believe that in addition to the things that we could actually write down are the things that we could list or the things that we could acknowledge that there are some things that God has blessed us with that there's no way we could even put our mind around it. We don't have words in our vocabulary that can completely and fully explain it. Listen to what Paul wrote in, in, uh, in Ephesians 1 about the blessings. He said, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And so yes, we can name this tangible thing, that tangible thing, that tangible thing. But Paul said, but he has also blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. There are ways that God has blessed us that we may never know about this side of eternity. The blessings of God. Another translation who's, it reads it this way, Ephesians 1 and 3. It says, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing that heaven has to offer. Whatever heaven has to give, we just have access to that. We have full run, full reign, and I'm thankful for that. We're blessed, even though we take many times that blessing for granted. Even though I take that, I'll leave you alone. Even though I take those blessings for granted, we're blessed beyond measure. We're blessed beyond anything we could dare dream. Paul reminds us that, that what we have in the Lord, in Philippians 2 and, and 1, he said, If therefore there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy. One writer said that you could correctly uh, interpret the word if for since. And it could be translated since in order to convey the true meaning. Paul was reminding them of all the things that they had received because of their relationship with the Lord. Because of Him, we've received the spirit of encouragement. We have received the spirit of comfort. We have received fellowship. We have received tenderness. We have received compassion. These are all things that we receive because we are in relationship with God. Amen. We, they have received it. Paul was saying, but we can say that ourselves, that we've received all of those things. Amen. The benefits that come from knowing and serving the Lord. I, I know many times... When we're standing at the face of some, something tragic or we see somebody standing at the face of something tragic or we read about things in the news or hear them in the news and we have often said, I don't know what people do that don't know the Lord. I don't know how people navigate through life. That's not a pious Christian comment. That's not, that's not, that's not us up here trying to look down on the rest of the world. I've never been more sincere in my life at times when I've said, I don't know what people do. I wouldn't know what to do if I didn't have the privilege to pray myself. But I also wouldn't know what to do if I didn't know I had the privilege that when I don't even know what to say 
or what to do that I can call on somebody. They don't need every intricate detail. They don't need, uh, they don't need all the bullet points. I could just say, I need you to pray for me. I just need you to pray for me. I, I know it can almost seem ritualistic if we're not careful. Our times of prayer requests in church. Uh, we just did it a moment ago. Names that we call. Names that are on the screen. Lifting our hands if there's an unspoken request. Sometimes there are things that we don't want to talk about. It's private. It's personal. But the Lord knows what we mean when we lift that hand. And I'm so thankful that I, when I lifted my hand, what I was doing was casting that care on Him because I know He he cares for me. I'm thankful for the spiritual blessings of God. How can you put a price on that? How could you put a price on that? The benefits that come from knowing and serving the Lord. I think being a part of the kingdom of God and the family of God is such an encouraging thing. And it's such a comfort within the context of the kingdom. Yes, we do have his word and I'm thankful for that. And we do have his spirit and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that, that there are times we have his word and spirit combined together. I mean, we feel that. We read his word and we feel the spirit of that word. There's a confirmation. There's a consolation. But I'm glad that in addition to having the presence of God and in addition to having the word of God, I'm thankful that I have you. Yes. Amen. Yes. Because... And I say this with great deference to the Lord. And I say this with great deference to the Spirit and His Word. But there have been times that I needed more than a scripture. And there have been times that I needed more than a warm feeling. I needed you. I needed your arm around my shoulder. I needed your hand in mine. I needed your eyes looking in the wide of my eyes. I needed to hear your voice. I needed, as the child said, some, something with skin on. We needed the Lord to touch us and strengthen us. And he used you. So yes, Lord, thank you for your word. Amen. We've got it in many facets. We've got it in many, many venues. We've got it on the written page. We've got it digitally. We've got it everywhere, the word of God. But I'm so thankful for the church, the men and women that make up the body of Christ. They're there. I'm thankful for your voice. That we're not singing alone. That we're not worshiping alone. That we're not praying alone. I'm thankful for the word of God. And I'm thankful for the spirit of God. But I'm thankful for the body of Christ. The church. There have been times in the past. And times right now. And there will certainly be times in the future. That we need one another in flesh. Knowing that you're loved. Knowing that you're appreciated. Gives us a sense of comfort. A sense of security. It's a sense of community. A sense of belonging. God has shown us tenderness and compassion when we needed it the most. And we've all experienced his, his blessings. And we've all experienced His mercy when we deserved His judgment. Amen. <clears throat> we've been blessed beyond what we deserve. And that's why the church of God should always be the most thankful people walking on the earth. God's blessings, I think, should replace every negative thought, every negative attitude with a positive one. So the first thing we need to do is remember all the many blessings of God. How could we complain when we look around, God's been so good to me. The songwriter said, I can't complain. Amen. His grace has been there. His mercy has been there. He's blessed us beyond our wildest imagination. In verse number two, he said, Fulfill you my joy that you might be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind, that togetherness. Amen. There is a strong call for unity. Just look at the words that he uses. We're, we're called to have the same love, to be in the same spirit of one mind. It reminds me of other times and other places that Paul made this same plea in essence but even to another church, another body. 1 Corinthians 1 and 10, for example. He said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Do you find that word same, 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 over and over, pressing us into the mold, not to, de not to destroy 
the idiosyncrasies that make us who we are, make us individualistic? No, but God is saying that we need to let his will be accomplished in our lives. I think it is possible that we all speak the th same thing. It is possible that we can all be united in our opinions. I know that sounds real un-American. That we could all think the same thing and that we could all have shared opinions because we are schooled daily to do our own thing and to have our own way and to step on whoever and whatever you need to to get wherever you need to get. That's how we are conditioned and, and I'm afraid that that plays on our psychic more than we would ever even imagine. Amen. But I believe that we can walk together because God has called the church to do that. I believe that our opinion should not just be conformed to somebody else's for the sake of conforming, but it ought to be conformed to the opinion of the Lord. We ought to seek His will and His opinion. What would you have me do? Not my will, but thy will be done. That is one of the greatest needs, one of the greatest needs of the church. Amen. And what a challenge. It's a great need, but it's a great challenge. That means we got to work on it constantly. I don't believe this kind of unity just simply happens because we got moved by a song. I don't think that kind of unity happens because we got moved by a sermon. I believe this kind of unity must be purposefully undertaken and that we got to work on this always the rest of our lives. That kind of unity has got to be a decision of the will and then we must resist the, 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 uh, the temptation to have selfish thoughts, selfish attitudes, selfish actions. Amen. Verse number three, Philippians two, let nothing, just the first portion of this scripture says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Don't do anything just to bring attention to yourself. Don't do anything to bring division among the body. Amen. There is an enemy of unity among people and that enemy lies within each one of us. Not just the fellow across the aisle. It lie, The seed of that lies in the heart of every man, woman, and boy and girl walk on the face of the earth. In other words, we ourselves can be the worst enemy of what God is doing to try to bring people together into a spirit of oneness. Our selfishness can derail the activity of God in our life because God is not the author of confusion. And if you want God to leave, he will walk out. Because he's not the author of confusion. He's not going to have anything to do with that. James seems to call it out for what it is. Because James asks a question. In chapter 4 verse 1. James asks a question and then answers a question. He says from whence come wars and fightings among you? So he poses this question. And then he says come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members. So where does all this come from? You. Amen. Selfishness is at the root of every sin. When we think about sin, at the core of every sin is the spirit of selfishness. God's love is the very opposite of that. It is selfless. It is others-centered. What can we do for others? And so if we would be like Him, then I've got to resist the temptation to be selfish, and the temptation to have it my way. For many years, I have served in various capacities that called on me to help other people deal with conflict in their life. And I have heard many, many stories about conflict, more perhaps than you could imagine. I listen to stories of devastation that comes, and, and, and it comes at the heart, and it comes on the heels of people that want to have their own way. With no yielding, no bending, no room for flexibility, my way, and almost without exception, the common thread that runs through all of those, all the stories of their own color, all the stories have their own narrative, of course. Every situation has its own narrative, of course. But the common thread that runs through them all is selfishness and pride. Me. Mine, my way. Nobody will yield. Nobody will bend. Amen? That is at the core of most conflict. The core of most conflict. 
they're, they're, these are two of the deadliest forces at work in our world. And it can be two of the most deadly forces at work in the church. While some would agree with me, tragically, there are some people that would never admit that these forces are at work in them. They know these forces are at work in the world, and they would even admit these forces are at work in the church. But as long as we can just use terms like the world and the church, that sounds like a foreign entity. But when we realize that we are the church, there's few people that say those forces are at work in me. At any one moment, we can become selfish. At any one moment, we can allow pride to rule and reign in our lives. Amen. They may be at work in the other fella, but I tell you, they also may be at work in my own heart. And that's what I've got to say. I've got to say to myself, be careful. Be careful because that propensity to, to be that way is in me. And so I've got to make sure that my flesh is crucified, that it's, it's submitted to the will of God. And so when I find myself, not if, I said when I find myself disgruntled and when I find myself complaining and when I find myself cynical, that, should need, that needs to be a red flag in my life. Wait. Wait. Doesn't mean life is perfect. Doesn't mean everything is smooth. But selfishness never brings people together. It always drives people apart. So we need to think about what we've received we need to understand the power of working together in harmony. And we have to resist the attitudes of selfishness in our own spirit. And then I need to understand that God is calling on me to place a greater importance on the other person than I would ever dare place on myself. The latter portion of verse 3, the first part says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But then the latter portion says how it ought to be done. It ought to be done in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves, preferring our brother. It is putting our brother first. Amen. Here is a command that has the power to deliver us from selfishness and pride. <laughs> Amen. You got to break the back of selfishness. You have to break the back of pride. And... And sometimes when you feel things are cropping up in your spirit, you just got to do what it takes to take care of that, to eradicate that out of your life. Amen. So you have to be proactive in that. Anybody ever fought stinginess? You know how you break the back of that? You show the devil who's really in charge. It, it can happen to us all. It can happen at weird times. It can happen at things that we wouldn't ordinarily even be selfish or stingy about. Just out of nowhere. And when those things happen, there's only one way to take care of that. And uh, we can be stingy with many things, not just money. That's probably where all of our minds went. But we can be stingy with many things. We can be stingy with our time. A good way to, to break the back of that is just give our time away. So this is what I'm going to do. But here's a command, loneliness of mind, let each esteem. It's a command that has the power to deliver us. It's, it's a command that goes against every sinful nature that we have. In fact, many would, would say that it's a command that's impossible to keep. How could we dare do that? And it may be an, an, an impossible command to keep within our own power, but the Lord is standing right ready to give us that power and that authority because God never gives a command that he doesn't, is not thoroughly committed to give us the power to Fulfill that command. He's not going to ask us to do something and then not give us the strength to do it. Amen. So here's what God says how we should treat. Uh, here's what the Lord says about how we should treat one another. In Romans 12 and 10. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. In honor preferring one another. And so if we're going to be able to honor each other more than we do ourselves, then we're going to need a God-given sense of humility, true humility, not false, pretentious humility, but humility that is able to see ourselves as we really are before God. Humility informs us that we're no better than anybody else. No better. Humility is essential to any healthy relationship. Humility, preferring the other. There's an interesting story it's a true story I read several years ago in a book about a man, and not to give all the details for the sake of time, but a man who was invited to speak at, um, at, a, at a, a gathering of some sort, a, a, a national gathering, 
And for that moment, he was uh, holding an elected position. And so when he got to the hotel, there was somebody there that carried his luggage to the, his room. Uh, there was somebody there to help him every step of the way. The next morning when he was supposed to speak, there was somebody that picked him up, brought him straight to the venue where he was speaking, took him in straight to the back. And so when he asked about uh, some coffee, he said, may I have a cup of coffee? They said, oh, absolutely. And they went and got him a real nice cup that he could have his coffee in. And, um, and so he spoke that year. The next year, he was no longer holding that office, but he went back to the same venue. He was there to be a participant this year. There was nobody there at the hotel that waited on him and took his luggage up to his room. The next morning, there was no one there that, that met him. He had to drive himself or get a taxi and make his way to the venue. And when he got there, again, he wanted a, a cup of coffee. And, uh, but again, I got the story a little bit wrong. He was still asked to speak, but he no longer held the position that he held the year before. And so when he, was, he got there, he, he knew there was some coffee behind the curtain, or there was last year, so he asked about the coffee. And when he asked an attendant there about some coffee, they said, yeah, sure, there's a coffee pot right over there, around the back. So he went over there and got a styrofoam cup, got his own coffee. And then he went out, and he made his speech, but he took with him the cup. And he said, I realized something. That I never really deserved the other cup. I didn't deserve somebody picking me up at the hotel. I didn't deserve somebody meeting me the next day. I didn't deserve somebody picking me up. I didn't deserve somebody ushering me in ahead of the line. I didn't, I didn't deserve the other cup. He said, really, all I deserved all along was this cup. But it was because of the title that I held for a season that I was blessed. A very humbling scenario. And so humility is the ability to see ourselves as we really are. Because sometimes you can get to believe in the press reports. And not see us or see ourselves as God sees us. Flaws and all. Amen. Listen to what Simon Peter says. 1 Peter 5 and 5. He said, likewise ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all ye be subject one to another. And be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. He said, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. If you'll humble yourselves, God will exalt you. Because the, pride, the path of pride leads to a downfall, but the path of humility puts us in a position where God can truly do something with us. And so as we humble ourselves and bow ourselves in the presence of God and acknowledge Him as the Lord of our lives, surrendering ourselves to His will on a daily basis, amen, keeping our hearts right with Him, amen, that's what we have to do. That's what we have to do. I want to just make one closing comment here. And musicians, can, you can just stay if you would like. But Philippians 2 and 4, the Bible says, Look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others. To refocus on the needs of others. Not about what we need. And in order for a, a church to really be healthy, you can't just have church aimed at the church. Every service. We've got to be others-centered. Who here may need something from the Lord? And so I believe that the mark, of the, the, the mark of a true Christian is that we have a genuine love for others and the welfare of others. And we will want to do everything we can do to encourage somebody else. Encourage them to trust the Lord. Encourage them to follow them with everything they have. And we've got to be concerned about those that are around us and doing what we can to strengthen somebody else around us. Someone may be thinking, well, if I look out for the needs of everybody else, then who's going to look out for me? And the answer to that is pretty straightforward, and that's God. And that's who you want watching after you. Amen. Because God can even use some of the people that you're, you're trying to help to help you. And I can tell you firsthand that there is a real mystery to ministry. I'm not talking about pulpit necessarily just pulpit ministry. But when you stop 
along the way to encourage or to strengthen someone else, you'll be amazed that in turn, they will minister to you. It's the mystery of ministry. I've stood in many different places trying to be a strength to someone else who may have been walking a lonely path. Visited people in nursing homes, visited people in assisted living facilities, visited people in jail, visited people in prison, visited people in hospitals, visited people that were shut in in their own homes. And you go there, I'm not alone. I see heads already shaking. You went there to help them. You went there to encourage them. And I will tell you that many times some of the people that were the lowest are the ones that picked me up the highest. It is amazing. It's almost embarrassing. It's almost as though you wonder what in the world just happened. I came here to encourage you. I came to strengthen you. And somehow through the mystery of ministry, we were ministered to. I mentioned this when I opened this morning, this evening, but I felt led to preach along the same lines of my message Sunday. Sunday, I referred a lot to Acts 4, primarily preached from verses 32 to 35. And so this evening, I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to conclude my message with reading from verses 31 and then just a little bit of verse number 32. Acts 4 and 31 says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and and they spake, rather, the word of God with boldness. Amen. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. So that's what happened when the church came together. Amen. When they came together, they prayed, and the place was shaken where they assembled. This is not Acts 2. This is Acts 4. (laughs) This is not just one and done Acts 2 outpouring, day of Pentecost, upper room experience. This is Acts 4, praying together, assembled together, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking the word with boldness, and the multitude of them that believe were of one heart and of one soul there's something powerful about a people united I know I mentioned it Sunday but so built we the wall for the people had a mind to work amen we have to center our hands we have to center our hearts we have to center our will around the will of God that means I can't have my way every time that means everything doesn't go in my favor every time Lord, what would you have me to do? Amen. One mind, one accord. Can we lift our hands and just pray and ask the word of the Lord to touch us this evening? God, I appreciate you tonight. Dear God, I love you this evening. I thank you, Lord, for the hope that your word brings to us. Your hope, your hope, God, that hope that abides in our spirit, that hope, Lord, that resides within your word But your word is not just a book. It's not just parchment. It's not just ink. But God, your word is a living seed. And I'm asking you, Lord, to let the authority and the power of your word reside in us. Let it come alive in our heart and in our minds. We love you and we honor you and we bless you tonight. I pray, God, that we would be that unit, that we would be that one, that there would be a oneness, a singleness of mind, a singleness of heart, a singleness of spirit. Oh, that's what we need. That's what we need in the name of Jesus. In the name.